Hey, welcome everybody to uh, Tuesday Night Conversations with Pass to Understanding. Um, tonight, I'm really happy to be joined by uh, Rabbi Johanna Kinberg, and she'll introduce herself here in just a minute. And we, we had some Zoom challenges here for a little bit this evening that's kind of thrown us off a little bit. So we also have an imam that will hopefully join us here in a few minutes. And if not, um, you're just going to have to put up with, a, with uh, Johanna and I a little bit. So um, just a couple things about this. We plan to do a Zoom uh, webinar every Tuesday night here for the time being um, and have a little excellent conversation with people from all kinds of wisdom traditions. And not all of those are going to be religious, uh, but, uh, but, but we believe every wisdom tradition has something to offer uh, us, in, especially in conversation with each other. So uh, on Thursday nights, uh, Paths to Understanding, which was formerly the Tracy Levine Center and also Neighbors in Faith, is going to be offering a, a Thursday night um, viewing party about Challenge 2.0. That'll also be at 7 o'clock at night. And of course, we'll be on next week as well, and we're working on those guests um, as we speak. Um, if you have any ideas that you want to, or any topics you'd like us to cover, please send any emails to general at paths to understanding.org. That's general at paths to understanding.org. And we'll be able to incorporate those uh, into uh, future shows. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, uh, Rabbi Johanna, would you please uh, just give us a little introduction of yourself and then I'll circle back and do me a little bit. Absolutely. So I'm Rabbi Johanna Kinberg and I'm the rabbi at Congregation Kola. It's so wonderful to be able to connect at this time of um, difficulty in our society and to be able to continue having meaningful conversations across space and time. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm Terry Kylo. I'm a Lutheran pastor, have been for about 28 years uh, in the ELCA, and I've been the executive director of Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center here for several years. And, and now uh, we've rebranded both of those and merged those into one organization called Neighbors, or called, excuse me, called Paths to Understanding. Um, and so uh, I'm just happy to be here with all of you. And yes, it is a time of incredible anxiety and change and uncertainty. And that's why we picked the topic uh, for tonight. You know, how do we uh, identify and handle anxiety, loss, and, and as well as finding hope, uh, you know, during this time. So, Johanna, first, I just would ask, uh, how are you um, yourself dealing with the current situation? Uh, how's it feeling to you? What are you doing to handle it? I think like many people, um, I'm in that rejiggering of life phase where, you know, I, I understand that if my family and I, um, you know, take appropriate safety precautions and try to be as safe as possible, that we're probably going to be okay. And that means all being in our house together and figuring out what that means is to, you know, have this, this sacred space, but be um, in it all the time, all together. And so moving things around both physically, psychologically, um, spiritually, all forms. There's a lot of movement happening, including figuring out how to do most of our work over Zoom. Um, so that's, we're, 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 what I say, recalculating. Like when you're going down the road, you make a turn and it says recalculating, we are recalculating. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, and we also have a good friend joining us here um, in just a second, and he's going to get on his headphones. I'll just share briefly, uh, um, you know, how we're doing. Uh, my, my wife, uh, um, you know, just is going to be filling out unemployment uh, forms uh, this evening. And, uh, We've got an 80-year-old mother uh, living with us, so we're really concerned about her health. And uh, we're also in that, in that you know, kind of reformulating like how we live and how do we, how do we uh, sort of create a, a habit during the day that, that, that honors all the sort of the needs that human beings have and uh, trying not to watch you know, too very much news because it, that can be so overwhelming right now. And uh, we're also finishing up a small house remodel. So um, that, that's kind of coming at sort of an awkward time. And brother, uh, would you be willing to introduce yourself and, uh, and, and tell us how you're handling the situation right now? Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we had a little bit of a difficulty logging in, so I apologize it's for okay. the delay. It's, uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's happening with Zoom right now, I think. So they're doing well, but there's a few hiccups here and there. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Pastor Terry and everyone for uh, putting this program together. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight with uh, my fellow uh, brothers and sisters. 
And, um, you know, it's a time of uncertainty, definitely. Uh, we're all panicking in a way. Uh, even those that are uh, strong in faith are, you know, they get a little bit shaken up sometimes. Um, but, uh, you know, we have an 86-year-old grandmother in my house. Um, and uh, I've been taking a lot of precautions and, uh, you know, the hardest thing for me, to be honest with you, is not seeing my congregation on a daily basis now. Um, that is probably the, the thing that I miss the most. It's just seeing uh, my congregation. Uh, we pray five times a day, so we were seeing each other a lot. <laughs> yes. So, so please tell us more. Please share your name with everybody and also oh, I'm the sorry. organization you're part of. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, uh, my name is Abdurrahman Karie. It's a little bit hard to say, but um, you can just say Imam Karie. Um, <laughs> like, you know, Carrie Irvin and, you know, the basketball player. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, my name is Abdurrahman Kari. I am the Imam of the Islamic Center of Bothell. Yes. I've been with them for the last three years and um, served as Imam in many other centers in the uh, Seattle area. Uh, and previously, I studied in, uh, in Egypt and here in uh, uh, Central Washington University. Right. And I'm constantly involved in my community and a lot of interfaith work. And uh, me and Pastor Terry have been good friends for a long time and been inspired by his work also. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, brother. And so, um, you know, we didn't have any chance to talk about how we were going to do this tonight. We were going to log on at 630 before we had some login problems. But we're just going to kind of launch into this a little bit. And and we're each going to be taking some turns uh, a little bit. Um, so what do our Abrahamic traditions teach? us about how to recognize and deal with anxiety and and i'd like to start off with uh, imam Kyrie, if you would oh thank you um you know we praise uh the god the almighty um uh, at first and always we praise him and we seek his help in in guiding us uh, in this time of uncertainty and turmoil and we ask god to heal all those who are sick all those who are in pain and uh, we have to continue to pray and, and seek spiritual connection with, with God during this time of confusion. Um, and, uh, you know, anxiety is one of the things that, you know, uh, happens to everyone here, uh, whether you're a student, whether you're a parent, whether you're a, you know, uh, any, any part of your life, you're going to have some sort of anxiety. But the important thing is how you deal with it, how you manage it, how you uh, overcome those, uh, you know, difficult situations. And in our faith, there's a lot of um, emphasis on, you know, patience, um, being patient during the time of adversity, in the time of hardship, uh, putting your reliance on God. Um, there's a huge, huge, um, you know, component to that. But also there's a psychological aspect to it. You know, there's people that go through a severe uh, it's a disorder and, and we have to make sure that, you know, they get the right help um, if they are uh, in that situation. It's not just spiritual, uh, you know, uh, aspect of it, but it's also making sure that they're getting the right treatment uh, to deal with those uh, anxieties. And I think in this, in this time that we're in, and that's why we're having this discussion today, it's really important that, you know, we overcome those anxieties. And that's why you're having, you know, if you look around, you see people panicking and, you know, overstocking on things like paper, toilet papers. But um, uh, what, needs, what we need to realize is that, you know, uh, in our faith, uh, in, uh, and I'm pretty sure that in all the Abrahamic teachings, what we learn is that with every hardship comes ease. You know, and that's, a, a, you know, a testament to uh, what is taught in our book, that every hardship, there's going to be ease at the end. You know, God has created in this world uh, challenges for you and I, and each person based on their, you know, relationship with God and their uh, commitment to, to serve God is that level they'll be tested. You look at the example of Abraham, how many challenges and difficulties he went through and all the other great uh, messengers and prophets of God, how much you know, difficulties that they endured. But the important thing is overcoming it and, and putting a heavy reliance on God. You know, that's, that's what I find as a, um, a way of managing. Now, obviously there's uh, steps and, and things that I would love to share today about managing these anxieties. Well, that's, that's, that's beautiful, brother. And, and we'll, we'll certainly have some chance as we keep talking here to talk about, 
you know, some ways that, that we can um, kind of manage our anxiety. I think, you know, from a, a, a Christian position, and, I'm, and I'm, none of us are speaking for all of our entire tradition tonight. Um, we're, we're speaking as, as, as teachers and leaders within traditions. Um, but as I, as I think about um, some of the stories in, in the Christian scriptures, um, you know, certainly you have, uh, you know, Paul and, and Silas uh, thrown in prison. And uh, they must have experienced incredible anxiety in the middle of that situation, not knowing what was going to happen. And, and I think about what they did in response to that, that they, they sang songs and they prayed aloud uh, with and for each other and uh, in the presence of the other, other folk there. And um, from a Christian you know, point of view, um, you know, anxiety and fear are, are sort of built into the good creation. They're, they're a part of it. The reason that we fear is because we love. You know, I fear for my 80-year-old mother-in-law because I love her. And so therefore, I, I, I do my, my fear teaches me then to exercise care um, in what we bring into the house and, and how, how we are distancing ourselves and sort of staying home most of the time. Because we, we love our family and we want to take good care of them. Uh, because God created the world very good. And that, um, uh, but, but what can happen to fear, which, which can teach us caution and care about things, is that it can get blown into anxiety, which kind of takes over in, in some ways, begins to, to almost possess us or, or uh, get us into a situation where we can't quite um, feel our other feelings because we're so concerned for the future. And I know that, um, you know, that, uh, that, that Jesus um, in his life experienced anxiety as well. And, and, that's, um, and that for Christians is kind of the core, um, that, that for, for many Christians, we understand Jesus to be God who became a human being and who therefore experienced what it's like to be human. And so when, whatever we're going through at the moment, like we can understand that, that God understands what that's like. And that, and that God, so, so Jesus, uh, uh, the night before he was arrested, he was uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying. And he was feeling tremendous anxiety. So even if we're in the middle of this anxiety right now, we know that, that God, um, from, the, from the position of the Christian tradition, um, you know, understands fully what we're going through and is present with us in it. And, and that that's, uh, and that, you know, God loved this world so much that God, that God not only created it good, but that God's willing to, um, to join it. That's sort of the, I think the heart of the Christian tradition. And that can help us to relax a little bit because we know that in the midst of our anxiety, we're not alone. We have community around us. We have neighbors that we can reach out and care for. And we have a creator who understands what it is to be, uh, to be anxious, who understands us loves us as we are, and is here in the, in the middle of it with us. Um, Johanna, how about you? What would you like to say about anxiety? Well, you know, anxiety is something that is very common within the Jewish community. Um, and we, you know, both on an individual level, but also on a collective level in the sense of feeling like death and destruction has sort of been nipping at our tail feathers for a long time. And I've always considered myself to be a, one of the fortunate generations of Jews in world history to have lived such a comfortable life growing up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but I think that we have this underlying sense in our community that anything could happen at any time. Um, and so we're in some ways we're sort of made for this in terms of being very adaptive as a community to figure out how can we continue to connect together and to our holidays and our cycles that draw us forward constantly. So we had um, Purim, which was what our last holiday that we missed. Um, but part of the Purim story is that throughout Jewish history, um, Jews would write a scroll, like the scroll of Esther, every time they sur survived a catastrophe. And they would put it in the ark. And so, so, for example, like my congregation in Kirkland, after all of this, could write a scroll telling the story of COVID-19. And then on the anniversary of that, we would, we would come out and we would read the scroll and we'd have a great feast and we would give charity. And um, we have that embedded in our in our 
tradition is that we are going to survive this and overcome it, and then we will tell the story. And so already I'm thinking about this time next year, telling the story that we're going to, we're going to walk through the story together, but we're also going to get to the other side of the story together. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love, I, I really, really honor and respect what both of you said there, you know, so much. And uh, let's, let's, well, let's move on to the next question and then we'll have some time to reflect with each other in a few minutes. Uh, the next sort of question here is, um, what do our Abrahamic traditions teach about dealing with loss and grief? And, uh, and, and this time I'll, I'll, I'll go first. We're kind of rotating through this with everybody. Um, you know, so again, um, you know, from kind of an incarnational perspective within Christianity, we understand that loss and grief are a part of life. And that they are, again, part of the good, very good sort of nature of the world. So when God loves the world, like God, God loves that as well, even though it is difficult and hard. And I, I think about, about people right now in our society experiencing loss and grief at kind of a, of an incredible rate. Um, and and uh, it's, it's easy, like my nephew, for instance, was probably going to be playing in the, in the, uh, the NCAA tournament. You know, and he's worked his whole life uh, at that uh, to, to get good at basketball and, and his family and his friends and he himself and all of us who are hoping to watch him are, are, are really missing that opportunity. And of course, we, we, we know that that's a minor grief in, in the grief that's, that's impacting all kinds of people, both, uh, both in terms of their own health. Uh, people who are part of more vulnerable communities, whether that's in a nursing home or a hospital, uh, uh, hospital staff, homeless people, people in prisons. Um, and, and so um, there's just an awful lot of loss happening right now. It, it, and, and almost so much in a way that it's, it's hard to keep up with and kind of let yourself even, even notice for yourself. And, uh, but what we know uh, from, the, from the Christian scripture stories is that Jesus was willing, was, uh, was, was a, a part of that experiencing grief and loss as well. Um, he, he wept when his friend Lazarus died. Um, he himself uh, experienced, um, you know, loss and, uh, and, um, and, and had to take time to, to weep over it. Um, and, uh, you know, no one was there to tell him to hurry up and get tough. <laughs> you know, he, he embraced those feelings because when we, when we experience loss, we're, we're also experiencing a form of love. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the thing for this moment that I just want to share is um, it's okay to take a part of your day and lament and, and to grieve whatever it is that you're losing, whatever it is that has changed for you. And kind of take some time and, and, and allow that loss to like sink in a little bit and hold it for a minute and hold yourself knowing that God is holding you in the middle of that as well. Um, Johanna, how about, how about you? How would, what would you like to say about grief and loss? Mm. Well, you know, Jewish tradition has a lot of um, pretty powerful rituals around loss and mourning for death. And it's related to retreating from your life. And so when someone passes, um, you would, the first week you would sit in your home and you wouldn't go out and you wouldn't, you know, you would basically do what we're doing, which is quarantining. And um, for the first week and then for the, in the first month, there's rituals and then there's rituals for a whole year. But it really is about retreating from your life to acknowledge the death and the loss, um, a retraction. And in that retraction, and in that allowing for that space, something born anew, which is a new relationship. And in this case, it's a relationship with um, moving from being a physical relationship to a spiritual relationship with your loved one. So when I think about what's going on in our society right now, and especially with COVID-19, I mean, there is a mourning because we're, we're seeing I mean, in, in many ways just how weak we were, we have been as a society in terms of caring for people. And so I, I feel like it's a, the tin has been ripped, ripped off the can of sardines. So you can see what's inside and there's a lot of mourning and grief. Um, and we are retracting all into our homes and creating the space, which I pray, hopefully God, something will be born anew for our society where we um, in our morning come to a realization of the importance of taking care of each other and sharing the burden of suffering more equally amongst 
all of members of our society. Yeah. Imam Kari, what do you, what do you uh, want to share? Well, um, it's a very good question and a very relevant question to the time that we're in. Um, as we're seeing, you know, every day people are dying. And sometimes, you know, we see uh, figures, we see a statistic, you know, like, oh, you know, today 800 people died. I was seeing, you know, Italy, that, you know, they were saying uh, in 24 hours, 500 people died. It's a number. Um, and sometimes, you know, we see those figures and we lose connection to um, those people that died were, you know, a father, a mother, a grandmother, a grandfather, a daughter or a son of someone else that loved them. And they're going through a very difficult time. And in our faith tradition, faith, you know, death is not something that we shy away from talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's something that is part of our life and people will experience the loss of a beloved person, you know, sometime in their life. And it's a common discussion that we have in our gatherings and it's not something we shy away from because we believe in our tradition and I'm sure in all the Abrahamic tradition is that God creates life and death and he tests us in this world to see who of us will do good actions in this world. And even our, our prophet Muhammad, uh, peace and blessings upon him, he used to say that when, he, and he lost all of his children in his lifetime with an exception of one of his daughters and one of the you know statements that he used to say was um the the eyes shed tears the heart uh you know is in pain and we are saddened by your departure every time that he lost someone he used to grieve and griefing and being you know emotional at the, the loss of a life is a natural uh, feeling to have and not something that you should feel ashamed about, rather, you know, acknowledging and let those emotions out, let those feelings out. And, you know, you should give yourself some time to grief and, and to be sad because you lost someone that you love. Um, but what we also believe is that there is um, a life after death and there is a life in where a person, when they leave this world, that they will go to. And, um, you know, and this is amazing because you know, we're taught in our tradition that, you know, uh, as our prophet, peace be upon him, said that wonderful is the affair of a believer, the affair of a, you know, of a person, um, that in every situation there is goodness for them. Uh, and that is not a case, you know, exceptional, except for those who believe in this. Uh, when good things come their way, they're thankful to God. And when they experience, you know, hardship and difficulty, they show patience during those adversities and there is still reward for them. So in each and every case, whether you're patient during adversity or whether you are, um, you know, thankful and you show gratitude during times of, uh, you know, abundance and goodness, both situations will be rewarded. And that is the cycle of life. Sometimes it brings you good things where you're happy about and then you're excited like marriage and birth of a child and you know those are things that make us all happy and we celebrate those occasions and there are times where we're sad and we're grieving and we're you know emotional and we're you know we feel empty sometimes and that's when someone leaves this world and that's how god creates this is the cycle and the challenges of life but uh the key thing is to not let it overtake you and to put your you know reliance on god and and realize that you know uh, that also I myself one day will have to go, and I will leave just like someone else left. So what am I doing in order to make sure that you know uh, I prepare for myself for that day? I should forgive others. I should you know help someone else. I should uh, you know treat my neighbor good. I should uh, in this time, especially of crisis and uh, complete confusion, it's important that. We don't lose the humanity in us uh, as we remember we see people dying and we might even uh, encounter with someone uh, that might die of coronavirus but it's important that you know we we were aware and we're cognizant about um, those who are around us and I think uh, you know death is sometimes you know looked at as, as a very um, you know ugly topic and a very scary topic to talk about but the more that we discuss it uh, and especially if you if you went through a moment of loss 
it's important that you have someone that you talk to about it so that you don't bottle up those emotions and, and look at it from the, the light of, you know, and from the side of, uh, you know, the spiritual teaching of uh, death, of leaving this world and transitioning to a life uh, uh, of the hereafter. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a difficult time and there's no words that can encapsulate the, the emotions that someone is going through. But the only thing that I would tell anyone that meets someone that is going through a uh, moment of loss is to be a support for them. You know, give them a shoulder to cry on. Give them, you know, an ear to listen uh, that they can, you know, uh, uh, listen to. And, and that, is, that is a very important concept. And, and I hope that, you know, that we all uh, find comfort in this time of, you know, hardship and difficulty. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw a little curveball at, at all three of us here before we, we talk about hope for a minute, because I think it would be really good for us to talk for a moment about what are some practical things people can do to deal with kind of anxiety and loss, you know, during this time uh, when, when, when some of our normal habits and patterns of behavior and, and aren't, aren't there. Uh, so do either of you have any, any, uh, any things you'd like to share about, about things people could do to, to deal practically with their fears or anxieties and or their loss? Well, I think, um, you know, it's, it can be a challenge for many people to engage with the technology of Zoom and our Facebook Live or the many, many options that we have through connecting through technology, but I'm really encouraging people to push themselves as I'm pushing myself um, to embrace this blessing that we have for being able to create community and have a sense of um, mutual support through the technology. So I'd say that's the first. Um, I think that dancing is really helpful, you know, to dance and to put on music and to, you know, really, you know, enjoy life. I'm bringing, you know, flowers into my homes, opening up the windows. Um, you know, there, for myself, there's lots of things that I'm doing that are sort of the, the the things that are propping me up all the time. I have to surround myself with those with those things, and we we have a um, a saying in Judaism by Rabbi Nachman of Brazla, "Mitzvah Gedola Lihiot Basimcha Tamid," which means it's the greatest of mitzvahs, it's the greatest commandment to be in a constant state of joy, which can seem really offensive, you know, in some ways if you're thinking of someone that has clinical depression, you know, to say, "Oh, you should always be in a state of joy," but I think it 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 is really um, a beautiful uh, complement to what the imam was, was teaching, what our imam was teaching about always being th thankful to God for the blessings that we do have. And as long as we have life breath in our body, that's our first bless blessing, that's our last blessing. As long as that life breath is flowing through us, we can give thanks and praise. And so, you know, now that we have more time at home, we create a sanctuary in our own home and in Jewish tradition is called Midash Ma'at, which is bringing the tabernacle, bringing the, the mosque, bringing that sacred space into your own home and letting it be your place of praise with your own family um, if you live with other people in the most intimate ways. So I guess church, mosque, synagogue now is all over in our own little homes. <laughs> You know, I just a couple of things I would I would just add there, and I think all those are beautiful. Um, you know, number one, we've been trying to connect with all of our neighbors, you know, from a distance, and make sure that all of our neighbors know that that we, we've got each other's backs right now, and that if somebody is ill or if if somebody's immune compromised in any way, that we're happy to go get food and groceries for each other, mm -hmm. and that really I think has helped calm the whole neighborhood down and. When we go outside and see each other outside, we're waving and we're talking to each other. So just, you know, be sure you're connecting to some people around you. I think, you know, finding some patterns for your days are, are really important. And I think uh, we can learn from, our, from, from, from each other around, uh, and I've learned, especially from my, my Muslim sisters and brothers, the power of prayer multiple times a day. And that's not, as I, usually I will pray once a day. But I'm finding that that I need the the sort of the the, the momentary Sabbath of pr of prayer um, right now, uh, just to allow myself the space to breathe and to receive and recognize, you know, the blessing of life, um, as you said, Rabbi. Um, and then I think, of course, you know, connecting with friends, uh, of course, really important. But I, I think as well, I mean, I think our practice of of Sabbath. Um, taking a day and if you can't take a day you know take take from noon until six on on sunday or something 
or, or on Saturday or on Friday, find a period of time where you're not going to be busily working around and preparing for, for the future. Like take some time uh, and, and just, and just allow yourself to be. And I think that's a great way to deal with some of that anxiety as well as, you know, consider giving some money away. Um, if you have a little bit, of course, you got to plan for the future, but there are lots of food banks right now that are really struggling, uh, people that are, that are in need. And sometimes when I'm feeling uh, the most uptight about my own financial situation, the best thing for me to do is to give some portion of it away. And that that moment of trust can help break some of this cycle of worry and, and, and anxiety. And I think that from what I've heard from you before, um, Rabbi, is that that's a part of what Shabbat is meant to be is to break some of that cycle of worry and, and anxiety and preparation and a feeling of scarcity. And to also know that we can live without the marketplace one day a week, which I think is an enormous source of anxiety right now for our society is, oh my gosh, everything's going to stop. Things will be closed. And, you know, for me, I, when I look at my neighborhood, I, I think, oh, it's like Christmas Day, because Christmas Day is always the quietest day in America. But Christmas Day, I always say, is like, Shabbat in Israel, which is every week. So there's a, there's this level of quiet where you can hear your family breathe. You know, you can hear the birds outside. There's a, there's a quiet that we haven't known in this country for a very long time. And I think that it's a, we're taking a step back, but we're also giving us a, a sabbatical to our land in a pretty major way. Yeah. yeah, mom, do you have something you'd like to share about things people can do practically? Yeah, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is that um, in our faith tradition, we're taught that during a um, pandemic or a plague, that one should, you know, quarantine themselves. So it's not something that is, you know, completely new to our tradition. It, when there was an outbreak of plague, people used to uh, take shelter in their home and isolate themselves uh, to minimize the spread of the disease. So um, for us, it's been, um, you know, practicing some of those traditions that were taught in our faith of, during the time of, uh, of a plague. But, um, you know, if for me, one of the, you know, the challenging things is, is keeping, your, keeping your sanity, right? <laughs> I think that's the, that is the, the hardest uh, part of uh, this whole process is when you, you know, every single second I think to myself, oh, I'm going to just go outside, maybe go see you know, a movie or go outside and, and go to the gym today uh, or take, you know, the, the family out for a restaurant. And then you realize that, oh, wait, the circumstances has changed and it, I have to remind myself. So what I did was starting this week, I, you know, I made a schedule of everything I'm going to do um, from the time I wake up to the time I sleep. And, um, and there's time where I log into my meetings and do my uh, classes and stuff like that. And there are times where I spend, you know, with family, we eat together. Um, and then there's a time where I, you know, have personal time to myself, my prayer, my worship, my recite recitation and then in addition to that the hobbies that you never got a chance to do you know um, this is the time to do it so for me it's been a little bit of painting um, uh, you know <laughs> that that's been a little bit fun um, but but finding something that you didn't have time to do uh, this is the moment to you know get creative and, and and find those activities i know a lot of people are you know they're binge watching their favorite netflix uh movie that they didn't get a chance to watch or something but eventually that you know <laughs> you'll get also tired of that so it's balancing uh those activities so that one doesn't become overwhelming i think that's the key thing in this it's balanced uh, in all of it but uh you know finding a quiet time where you uh, get to read uh, something that, you know, a book that you bought a long time ago that's just been sitting on the shelf, collecting a lot of dust. Um, or um, I know that, you know, with precaution uh, measures, what I do sometimes is I do go uh, and walk in the neighborhood, um, you know, just get some fresh air. I sit, in the, I sit outside in the balcony, um, you know, get some fresh air. It's important to do that, let the windows open. Um, and I, and the other thing is also finding, uh, you know, people to communicate with, um, because sometimes what happens is that, you know, you're with your family and you're just, you know, all together, but also calling extended family members, your neighbors, uh, just checking on them and seeing if they're all right. There is, there are a lot of people in our community who live alone, 
who don't have the luxury of having um, you know, uh, a family member or people in the house. So it's important that you, you know, you check on them also because they're probably feeling alone in their homes. Um, and that's something that you can do. And something that Pastor Terry mentioned was also, um, you know, giving a little bit of charity. Um, it's something that we've been encouraging our community to be a little bit, especially if you have the means and the ability, you know, give a little bit more. There are people in our community who um, because of this uh, virus are staying at home and many of them work in the service industry and they're, you know, at risk of not being able to pay some of their bills. So if you have the means, you know, give a little bit of char charity, it makes you feel better. And also you get to help someone out in, their, in this time of crisis. This is the moment where we get to see our humanity. You know, we get to see the character and the things that we've been taught for so long how do we bring it into practice? This is the moment that you, you know, you see the application of the scriptures that we've been reading for so long. And lastly, I would say, you know, um, uh, finding quality time. It's not just staying indoors, everyone on their phones glued to their TV. Um, let's go back to old fashioned times, you know, get a, you get a game board, get a puzzle, you know, yeah. do something that's really like, you know, engaging with everyone. I yeah. think, um, putting that into the routine would help pass the time and also look forward to these days that we're going to be experiencing. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And let's, uh, let's, let's, let's spend a moment or, or so talking about, about hope, like how we sort of uh, recognize the, the potentiality for hope in the middle of situations like this. And if you, Johanna would go first, that would be wonderful. Well, I am feeling very hopeful. Um, you know, one of the things that my family's actually been doing is we've been watching a lot of like disaster and zombie movies based on viruses. So we watched, we've watched World War Z and we watched War of the Worlds and um, learning about how you know, within the human consciousness, there's always been this fear of that which we can't see and can't control. And um, we live with that looming fear. And now that we have this environmental crisis that we're living in, I feel like, you know, I feel a great amount of hope that our stepping back as a society, stepping back as a civilization, as humanity, all of us being touched in this way and having an opportunity to reflect on our relationship to the world around us and to interlocking systems, both natural systems, but also human created systems, and to rededicate ourselves to creating justice where we can and creating life and peace and balance where we can. We know we're not in charge, but we can ease suffering. And so what I see is that, that yes, there's a lid that's being torn off and we're seeing a lot of stuff that's really hard to see. For example, you, who, how do you tell hundreds of thousands of people in this country alone who don't have homes, go home and quarantine yourself? That fallacy right there is so blaring in our eyes and is such a threat to us all. How can we not after this address this? So it, our paradigm is shifting and changing. Our country will never be the same. We will never be the same. And that's good because we need to evolve into a place of caring for each other and for the greater good and being more cooperative. And so this is, it's a hard lesson. It's a test. You know, no one, no one promised that everything was going to be all right all the time and that everything was going to be easy. This is hard. And I think the net outcome for our world will be something very positive, which will be a greater recognition of the oneness of all being and existence. Wow. Thank you. Imam, how about you? What do you, what do you see? Um, I think there's always hope. Um, we should never lose hope. Um, and it's a, it's, we have to strike the balance between that fear that's in our back, you know, the back of our minds and having hope, um, not just in, you know, uh, in humanity, but in God, uh, it's very important. And, uh, you know, there's a famous tradition in our faith that is taught where, um, you know, the prophet, peace be upon him, has told us that, that God will treat his servants according to how they think of him. You know, so, you know, how well you think of God, he will treat you accordingly. And I think it's important to have a strong, you know, hope in the mercy and his kindness and his uh, generosity uh, in this time of uh, confusion. Um, you know, I always reflect on the story of Joseph, um, who went through a great amount of hardship in his life, you know, from being, um, you know, a... 
uh, sold as a slave, then, you know, imprisoned. And then there was always, th that story always has a lot of hope, you know, from the beginning, you just think that there's no way out for him. There, you know, he's just, he's gone. You know, I mean, if you and I were put placed in those situations, we would like, you know, just, you know, throw our hands up and say, that's it, you know, we're done. But you find that there was so much, you know, hope at the end from the very uh, instant of his, that, that dream that he had. And I think, um, you know, hope is what is going to make, uh, get us through this, is having hope in our communities, having hope in this country, and for the whole world that we will get through this, uh, you know, humanity has faced um, difficulties and hardships much more, um, you know, uh, difficult than this. Um, but I believe that uh, with the help of God and with our, um, you know, humanity towards one another, we will get past this. But we have to keep that hope alive um, and keeping the light of hope is a very important part of our faith and a part of all of the Abrahamic teachings is to have um, a huge uh, hope in, in God and in, in his mercy and his help and his assistance in this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I think about, I have a, had an English teacher in high school um, who was a Roman Catholic and she would always say a sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Mm. And that was, that was something that she said to me frequently because I would often be off thinking about the future and all the challenges. And, and she was, of course, encouraging me to, um, to take on the part of the challenge today that I could take on, but also rest in the notion that there is, there is something greater than me at work in the world. And uh, I, I've always felt that. Um, I think even in, in the moments when I felt greatest anxiety is that I felt that there is, there is a something greater than me. You know, when my mother was diagnosed with MS, uh, when I was a young kid, um, you know, I always felt like there was something greater. And of course, you know, we in our tradition named that something greater, you know, God. Um, I think that the other part of the Christian tradition that's important to remember is for, for Christians is, um, is the idea of baptism, that it's, that the disorientation is a part of our tradition. Like uh, that we have an orientation to life, we are disoriented and we come to a new orientation. Um, that that's, that that's, that's actually supposed to happen a bit every day. And I think that we're having a big disorientation right now in our society. And that certainly has challenges, but it also brings opportunities. Because, uh, Rabbi, as you said, it's, it's becoming very clear that, that we have a society where the inequities, uh, the economic inequities and other inequities in our culture, in our society, actually are weaknesses for all of us. Not only is it morally wrong, it makes us weak in terms of how we respond to crises and how we live and thrive together. And I think uh, I've been thinking about this, uh, these, these folks that are talking about restarting economic activity and allowing our elders to die um, because the economic activity is the most important thing. And there's been a lot of, a lot of conversation in this country about that over the last you know, uh, 50, 60 years, basically making our economy into a kind of God. And I, I think that, that, that that's not a very kind God. Um, and it, it's not a very merciful one. It's not a compassionate one. Um, and, I, and so I think this is a moment when we can really think about um, what it is that's most truly important to us. Jesus also said that, um, that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Of course, that wasn't, that wasn't original to Jesus. And... Uh, um, but it, this is really a moment when we can sit and think, what is really important to us? What is really important about being human? And, and I think that, there's a, that, there's a, that there is a something greater than us that can lead us you know, to a kind of a new orientation in this time that can really help us to be more whole human beings and more whole human societies. Hmm. So what, uh, what did we hear from each other um, tonight that we that we appreciated in the last uh, 10 minutes or so of our, of our, um, of our conversation. 
this is the time for awkward silence. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I really appreciated, um, um, you know, from the Muslim community that focus on on community and caring for each other, and you know, and that that is that that constant engagement with each other, even if it's not going to be in person, is part of what keeps hope alive. You know, is the con the prayer, the constant engagement, and you know, when you I imagine that when you're praying five times a day. You, it helps you stay pretty solid with God and with yourself. <laughs> and I think that's, that's such an important lesson. And I know, Terry, you already were reflecting on that in your life, but I think that's, I so appreciate that. And from the Christian tradition, you know, something that w we don't talk about that much in the Jewish world, but that idea that, um, you know, that, that connecting into, um, I guess, God's loving hand, you know, that's, and, and that sort of having faith that everything's, you know, that, that things are going to be okay, which, you know, has been hard for us. We do have this idea of the, the whole world is a very narrow bridge, and the most important thing is not to be afraid. But that sense of, and, you know, that there's, there's a larger plan. Um, but now that I see, you know, living through this worldwide pandemic and knowing that this is something that's touching all of humanity, I mean, how can you not, you know, this is something about all of us and it's non-discriminatory um, and it's across borders and it's, so there's something very powerful about connecting into something larger than yourself right here, right now, being a human being. I mean, very, very powerful. So I really appreciate both of those from both of you. Um, I learned a lot. Thank you. And, and, and you know, likewise, um, both of you are exceptional community leaders. And, um, you know, just the fact that, you know, you're able to do this uh, program today uh, to bring, you know, some sort of comfort to the hearts of those who are um, going through a lot of confusion and uncertainty. Um, I, I really, um, you know, enjoy the perspective that I'm hearing from uh, both of these traditions that are very close to each other, um, uh, just to hear that we're all in line with those teachings and trying to, you know, provide some sort of guidance to our community, to our congregation. Um, and I know that for all of you that, you know, who are leaders in providing services such as, you know, prayer services and not being able to see your congregation, it must be also a challenge for all of you. Uh, but uh, the fact that, you know, uh, you're doing this program and you're uh, still continuing your effort uh, in this time of uncertainty and and using um, faith and spirituality to be a means of you know bringing us together um, I think that's a really powerful um, aspect and something that you know we're definitely going to take back also in our community um, to do more because people need uh, you know God at this moment they need to connect with God uh, at this uh, very uh, situation. And, and I believe that, you know, that having a connection to a, um, you know, a being above us who is over, uh, overwatching us and seeing our situation and, and, and humbling ourselves is an important part of our, uh, all of our, our, all of our teachings. And, and just the fact that, you know, uh, Pastor Terry, you're talking about uh, reaching to your, uh, out to your neighbors and, and grocery shopping for those people so that uh, they're looked after. And, and the fact that, you know, uh, our rabbi is finding uh, comfort in dancing and, this is something that, you know, um, is, uh, is, was intriguing to me and, and I really loved it. And, I, and really it's a, it's a time where we, we have to really start, you know, um, assessing our situation and start reflecting on our life and our, uh, you know, to, to see what uh, all the things that we have been learning and hearing about, how can we bring those, those, those commandments and those teachings into practice now? That, I think, really, for me, has uh, been uh, one of the most profound teachings that I've gained from these last few days. And obviously, I mean, um, it's, it's really, really sad sometimes when you see um, our leaders, um, you know, uh, thinking, and uh, like, as you said, Pastor, uh, you know, thinking only of, uh, of money and not uh, humans and, and not about, uh, you know, the human life. And we regard the human life to be the most sacred uh, of, of all, even more important than the religion itself is mm -hmm. human, human uh, protecting the human life. And that was one of the things that was very hard for our, um, for our congregation to grasp the idea 
that we will no longer be able to attend the center because it is obligatory to come for Friday prayers. It was very hard, but we said the human life, you know, protecting life is more important than you worshiping God. And for me to find, you know, um, our uh, leaders thinking more about the economy than uh, protecting the human life is just disheartening. But I hope that, um, you know, our uh, fellows and uh, our fellow human beings will also see um, uh, the light and, and understand that we have to, uh, you know, uh, do our part and our duty is to protect one another and to make sure that we're looking after each other. So that's been really the most profound lesson that I, I've learned during these days. Well, I, I, you know, from both of you today, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit challenged. Uh, you know, I want to say that I'm a little, uh, Johanna, you challenged me a little bit tonight uh, to think about dancing. I, I'm just not much of a dancer, <laughs> but I, but I, I do think that, uh, that um, although when I do dance, it's kind of a wild affair. Um, but um, but I, I, I think we've got to, you know, find a, you know, a little bit more kind of exuberant physical joy here uh, in this time. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to find a way to do that. For me, it used to be playing basketball. But, but maybe I'll go over to the, to the court over at the school uh, if no one else is over there and, and shoot some baskets here yeah. and, and get some of that movement in a little bit. Uh, and, you know, and, and just thinking about this whole sort of patience and adversity um, Imam that you talked about um, and I, I think about some of the stories of the Prophet Muhammad but I also think about you know Moses and Miriam and I think about you know uh, so many in, in, in the history of our traditions you know we, we tell stories about the people who faced adversity you know and were able to like continue to be human in the middle of it and then I just I just want to want to just kind of you know profoundly you know Thank you both for, for this for this notion that, that you said, Imam, about about you know the point of our traditions. I think, at least the point of the Christian tradition, is to help us recognize the beauty of being human, right? To to help us embrace our own humanity. Um, one great scholar I was talking with one day, and I, I said. Um, I think the core of the Christian tradition that if, if being human is good enough for God, then it's good enough for us. And that's of course understating it. But of course, all that was said in the, in the first chapter uh, in the Hebrew scripture in Genesis mm -hmm. is that, you know, God says, behold, it is very, very good. And so I just want to remind people that, that in this moment of, of adversity, like life is very, very good and adjust and adapt and find your patterns but remember remember that life is good even if it includes vulnerability and mortality and and that uh and so i i just really appreciate what both of you you know have had to say tonight any any last words from either of you here before we uh, get ready to sign off for the evening Um, I will share, oh, I'll share a reading about, um, that I brought to share, which I really love, um, which is, um, relates to our next holiday we're about to celebrate in a couple of weeks, Passover, we're going through um, the, the Sea of Reeds from Slavery to Freedom, it's, and this is by the American um, academic um, political philosopher Michael Walzer. He writes, standing on the ported shores of history, we still believe what we were taught before we ever stood at Sinai's foot, that wherever we are, it is eternally Mitzrayim, and that there is a better place, a promised land, and that winding way to that promise passes through the wilderness, and that there is no way to get from here to there except for joining hands, which we will not be doing, maybe touching elbows and marching together. And this is, you know, there's no way out of this but through it. And there's no way through it but together. Mm -hmm. Even though we're going to be in our individual homes, we'll be united in our hearts and in our spirits. Thank you so much. Imam, do you have something you'd like to share? Um, I'll wrap up, uh, you know, uh, this evening with, uh, you know, uh, few verses from the Holy Quran, uh, our Holy Scripture. And I love this passage and it reflects deeply in, um, you know, with the, the time that we're in. So this is from chapter uh, 94, 
uh, verse 5 to 7. And God says, So verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. Verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. He repeats it twice. Therefore, when you are free from your immediate task, still labor hard. And to your Lord, turn all your attention. And I think this is a very, you know, it brings solace and comfort to my heart that, you know, with every difficulty, there will be relief. Um, and I know that with certainty, there will be relief. And in this moment right now, when I'm, you know, I try to keep myself busy so that I don't, you know, lose my sanity. And when I am down, when I don't find, you know, when I'm lost or confused, then I turn my attention to God. And that's, I think, what I'm going to do uh, to get me out of this um, or to get all of us out of this uh, difficulty. And I pray for all of you that uh, God protects you and he protects your family and protects uh, all, all of us and all those who are sick, all those who are in pain. Uh, we ask God that he heals them quickly uh, and, and gives them a speedy recovery. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we hope that God takes this um, virus away from all of us and protect your homes. Thank you so much. Pastor amen, amen. <laughs> that was beautiful. So I, I'll just share from the Christian tradition. I, I've done probably in my career something like 250 funerals, maybe, maybe 300. I've, I've kind of lost track. That many of them we've read, you know, from Romans chapter eight, that that uh, in life and in death there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Hmm. And then also uh, from Revelation chapter twenty-one, uh, and behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, where mourning and crying and and fear and pain are no more. And uh, and we do we do long for that, and we trust that one day that day comes. But until then, there is nothing that can separate us from from the love of God because God chooses it to be so. Mm, so I just, I want to just say thank you to all of you who came tonight and will watch the show tonight. Um, it will be available, I believe, um, mm -hmm. uh, as a recording um, as well. We are planning on doing a podcast of some of these episodes as well. We hope to see you on Thursday night for the, uh, for the uh, viewing party, which will be, uh, from one of the earliest episodes of Challenge 2.0, hosted by Jeff Renner, um, where, where we're going to be talking about from me to we and from them to us. Um, and uh, so we hope to join you there. If you have any ideas or comments about the show, please send them to general at paths to understanding.org. And if you want to find out more about what we're up to, uh, join us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and, uh, and also uh, join us on our website. So uh, may God's blessing be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you both, um, Imam and Rabbi. It's wonderful to just be in conversation with you. I don't care if anybody else watched. It was just fun. So, so great. Thank you. Many blessings to you all. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.